Well, welcome everybody uh, to this part of uh, today's Jazz Sanctuary. I've been uh, so excited about this for so long uh, to welcome a very special guest um, for us on Jazz Sanctuary and really for jazz worship in general. Um, our very special guest today is jazz pianist and Presbyterian minister Bill Carter, who uh, serves a church in Pennsylvania. And he's going to talk with us about jazz worship, all things jazz worship and uh, also talk about a couple of pieces that he has selected uh, uh, video recordings of um, that uh, sort of uh, show uh, the kind of work that he does and has been doing for a long time now. So welcome to you, Bill. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. It's great to be here, Tim. Thank you so much. Yeah. Also joined today by um, Jock Irvin, uh, our Jazz Sanctuary uh, house band bassist and video producer for all things Jazz Sanctuary during the now increasingly long pandemic. Um, but um, he's, he's kept us going by having these wonderful productions during this time. So thank you for being with us today, Jock. Thanks for having me be a part of it today. Uh, Bill, I, I would really love to start with um, you're talking just a little bit about your own faith formation and um, call to ministry and how that all became entangled with jazz. <laughs> entangled is a good verb. Um, I uh, am a lifelong Presbyterian and uh, was raised in a congregation in upstate New York where my mom still worships. And uh, I went to seminary directly from college, uh, and I went into the church directly from seminary, first church for five years, and now I'm in my 31st year in a church in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, which uh, seems like an inordinate amount of time, but uh, I'm having a blast. Uh, so my faith formation uh, began in very traditional ways. Uh, we would do three hours on Sunday morning would be Sunday school, worship, and coffee hour, and we didn't miss any of them. Uh, and then afterwards, we'd go home, and over the roast beef, uh, we would uh, carve up the sermon and talk about it. Uh, <laughs> and I, I thought that was always uh, kind of independent and different from the world of jazz, which I also fell in love with. That was part of my formation as a person. Um, my mother used to play uh, Count Basie records around the house when I was growing up. And in our small town on the Susquehanna River, there was an independent foundation that would bring in a, a significant big band uh, every year. Uh, and, and so it was uh, Count Basie one year, and it was, um, let's see, Woody Herman, uh, Stan Kenton. Oh, my gosh. Maynard Ferguson. Oh. And uh, sitting in the old high school auditorium in about the third row with free tickets, just taking this in because somebody believed that good music would enrich the community. Mm. Uh, and then uh, when I was 13, one of my favorite stories, uh, I was a fumbling piano player. My grandmother gave me a paper bag. I mean, you guys remember paper grocery bags? Sure. <laughs> and I opened it up and there were two LPs. Remember LPs? <laughs> this bespeckled pianist by the name of Brubeck. <laughs> and uh, grandma said take these home and give them a listen mm. and uh, one of them was uh dave diggs disney oh one of jock's uh, all-time favorite album album yeah. my dad had that album when i was growing up a great <laughs> album and uh i what really knocked me out was hearing the invented counterpoint uh mm -hmm. rebecca and, and paul desmond and, and the way that they just chugged along and brought new life to some pretty stale tunes. Mm -hmm. And the worst compositionally was this uh, sappy waltz that the cartoon maiden sang to uh, Prince Charming called Someday My Prince Will Come. <laughs> and uh, I always thought that was like a, just a dreary moment in that cartoon. But when Brubeck played it, and then started putting it, superimposing time signatures and creating things. Man, I never heard anybody uh, make music mm. and enjoy it. Mm. Uh, I heard a lot of people replicate notes on a page, but not actually invent it in, in, free, in time. And 
I, I was knocked out. I had no clue what they were doing, uh, but intuitively I kind of had a sense that uh, they were playing off the page, mm. um, which has become a major theme for me, both musically, but also theologically, spiritually. Wow. Um, so uh, it, it kind of developed from there, played in a high school jazz band. Uh, when I was in college, I thought I should go into pre-med. That lasted about a semester and a half <laughs> or two or so. And uh, God spoke up and said, get out of this. And uh, so I needed the, those were the days when college students got out of school, you know, in four years, you know, eight semesters. <laughs> and uh, so I felt the obligation for my parents and also internally to just get out. So I had a philosophy degree and then had some kind of dramatic moments where I thought God was whispering me into the pastoral ministry. But to make up credits, I went to our college jazz band director and I said, can you help me out? Um, he said, sure. Write me three big band charts and uh, we'll do it as an independent study. Wow. And wow. that was the first time I discovered that um, I, I love to, uh, to compose, but also I love to organize. Uh, mm -hmm. There were uh, two different skills, uh, but, but that really kind of tugged on me. Mm -hmm. And then one day he called and said, oh, come on down to my office. And I walked in, he said, this is Don Sebesky, one of the outstanding great arrangers. And I had a private lesson with him and a private lesson with Jim McNeely, who was in the Vanguard big band and, uh -huh. and yada, 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 yada. And then had a decision to make uh, if I would actually follow the whisper of God and go to seminary or if I would pursue music. Uh, because I, I kind of sensed that music was not as heavy or not as weighty or not as important as uh, being a, a pastor or a preacher. And uh, proceeded in that illusion for about seven years <laughs> when on the day that I was uh, voted on by my congregation here in Pennsylvania, preached a sermon, they had the vote, they, they voted me in. And then a the guy stood up in the back row and said, uh, well, we've heard you preach. And that was pretty good. We want to hear you play something on the piano. And I said, I'm not here for that. He said, that's what you think. Wow. And uh, almost 31 years ago, that was, and it's been a great run, uh, twists and turns and a lot of bumps. But it was really out of the soil of that support within the congregation uh, that I began to work into a new way of thinking that this is about integrating all our gifts and not sectioning them off. Saturday night versus Sunday morning, right. et cetera. It's, it's all of a piece. Right. Right. So that's, that's what's going that's, on. I've, that's I've that's had two, two sabbaticals that explored music and jazz specifically mm -hmm. uh, as spiritual gifts or practices. And uh, this summer, uh, I'm going to take a third sabbatical uh, to write a book on the integration of jazz and the spiritual life. Oh, wow. I can hardly wait to read that. <laughs> I, I can hardly wait to write it. <laughs> oh, take a while. I mean, I, I keep digging in it. And with the pandemic, I was supposed to do this last summer. Uh, and that has jostled all of us. But um, mm -hmm. it's given me more time to meet more musicians, biographies, uh, more studies. Uh, just finished a biography on Mary Lou Williams. Um, wow. Another one on Phil Woods earlier in the week. Mm. Um, I'm going to start a book called Jazz and Justice, uh, probably tomorrow. Wow. Who, so that's, who, who wrote that book? Do you remember? Uh, no, it's downstairs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, wow. But it, it's brand new uh, and it looks tremendous. It looks at um, uh, the impact of racism, which has been so endemic within this tradition of music. And yet the, the music transcends it. Yes. I think in some ways redeems it. Yes. Yes. Wow. Well, that's well, I mean, the, form the formation is still going on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, I think that's uh, we, uh, our, our pastor Amelia, uh, who's also our vocalist, um, often, uh, you know, encourages the congregation to, uh, 
to periodically pick out a, a favorite member of the Trinity and see who it is currently. And uh, for Jazz Sanctuary, we keep coming back to the Holy Spirit uh, uh, because of that, um, you know, always uh, organic, ev evolving, unfolding quality of um, jazz uh, mm -hmm. and, and music, but especially improvisational music, but also of um, the life of the spirit and community as we're trying to evolve. And I can tell that's really been a part of what you and your congregation have explored together. Yeah, 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 yeah it's wonderful. I know that in through the years, um, uh, you, you have developed um, uh, resources for jazz worship, including the jazz hymnal. Um, and also Presby Bob, your, um, you know, your uh, uh, website and other things that have evolved out of your ministry. And I, I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about that. And also, I, I love the, uh, uh, the, the mission state statement. Presby Bob exists to create um, uh, music that glorifies God, uh, renews the Christian church, and models the integration of faith uh, and the arts. And that's, uh, I, I didn't know if you could maybe unpack that for us a little bit. That's pretty sure, wonderful. Sure. Well, at, as things developed here uh, all those years ago, um, I decided one year when uh, to answer the call of my organist who had to take a weekend off. And it was a Labor Day weekend and she couldn't find a sub. And in desperation, she said, could you play the hymns? And I said, well, yeah, I could do that. She said, are you going to jazz them up? And I said, I suppose I could. <laughs> and uh, over the next, over the summer, a uh, little quiet movement started that, uh, that we would get the word out. It would be just me and a tenor from the choir who would be mm -hmm. the song leading. And I'd reharmonize the hymns and, uh, and do something appropriate sermonically. And uh, they sent out a press release and the television cameras were there. Oh, my gosh. Uh, because on um, Labor Day weekend, uh, what do they have? Uh, traffic fatalities, <laughs> uh, fireworks accidents, uh, maybe some horrendous thing that happens at a lake. And they wanted something uplifting. So they came into this full sanctuary and um, our church had just begun to work with migrant workers. And they had bust, uh, two bus loads of them in, which added a whole lot more diversity to the crowd than there yes. normally was. Yes. And it was over the top. And then they asked me the question that horrified me. What are you going to do next week? <laughs> well, that was a pretty horrifying question. Yeah. I said, next week is rally Sunday. We'll start <laughs> Sunday school and we'll, we'll sing. I love to tell the story. But, uh, but that, that, again, planted the seed in this very imaginative and supportive church. And um, so about 10 years later, after developing a band, which was at first called Mogan David and the Grapes of Wrath, <laughs> at, which we couldn't use for copyright reasons. Um, uh, and, and knowing that there are great world-class musicians within an hour of here, um, New York musicians who live out in the hills to save money on taxes, uh, and coalesced around a quartet. And uh, one of them, my saxophone player from upstate New York, who came down and played for free, which I was not going to turn that down, <laughs> especially since it was new. And we kept having to think about materials. So I stepped, I kept revising and every year we kind of aim for that mm. apart from whatever kind of so-called secular gigs we would take. Um, I would be writing at least three or four settings of hymns. And then about 10 years after that, we went for a grant at Calvin College, uh, uh, Calvin Institute for Christian Worship. They have these, uh, $15,000 grants to help develop a project in the church. Mm -hmm. And we had a little coalition of people who studied uh, existing jazz vespers. We're very disappointed about what we found. Mm. That was like a, a couple of prayers, maybe a quotation from some Swami. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll play three Cole Porter tunes that have nothing to do wow. with, with the liturgy and the formation of, of faith. And I said, well, let's just start with public domain hymns. And so the project was to develop a, 
a resource called Swing a New Song to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And we put out the word and we had a little grant money to disperse among the musicians for arrangements we received. I cleaned up some of mine. And uh, at some point, we're going to copy edit the whole thing and clean it up because uh, there, there are occasional mistakes and things that are difficult and page turns to. But uh, it has really stood the test of almost 20 years now. Wow. Um, it's a and, wonderful resource. It really is. Oh, well, thank you. And, and we tried to pick the best of what we had researched uh, and, uh, and include some of that. Calvin College had some Vesper services going on. Some friends were doing various things. Uh, with the annual big jazz service on Labor Day, I began to explore scripture as a musical resource. Hmm and found all these uh, great stories that never make the ecumenical liturgy, much less the pulpit. Um, one of my favorite is uh, when the prophet Samuel is anointed, um, or I guess it's when it's King Saul is anointed by the prophet Samuel. Uh, he's told by the prophet, a band of prophets will meet you and they show up and they're playing music, musical instruments and they're caught up in the frenzy. And <laughs> Yeah, I know who these guys are. Yeah. <laughs> they are not church musicians. <laughs> <laughs> these are my buds. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and to be caught up ecstatically yes. in music yes. and not simply confined to expertise or some model of perfection, yeah. um, which are not really jazz categories. Right. I mean, we're about invention and creativity as well as good time and good intonation and all of that. Um, and, and began to think strategically then about the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then we put on four or five uh, conferences at a national conference center on jazz in the church mm. outside of New York. And we brought in people. Uh, we gave Dave Brubeck an award and he sat down and played a couple of tunes for us. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it has been a wonderful ride. Uh, yeah. so, so those are some of the resources. Uh, the band has, uh, I think, 10 CDs and a couple of DVDs. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we're going to do an 11th, probably next winter. I've just composed a jazz requiem. Mm. Wow. And uh, it, it's not sticking to the Roman Catholic mass because I'm not Roman Catholic. But uh, mm. it, tried, it uses some of the traditional... Um, grieving texts and funeral texts as a way of maybe touching on all the losses we've dealt with with right. the pandemic. Right. Wonderful. And yeah. will that come out, will that be performed, but also recorded? Uh, uh, separately, yeah. Yes. So we're going to, we've scheduled it for, I think, the third Sunday of, uh, of, of October in the church with the church's concert series. Mm hmm and then uh, I'd like to record it after Christmas uh, professionally and, and just get it right. Wow. Um, Wonderful. So that's, it's, it's always Perkin. It's uh, always Perkin. Yeah. Um, is is presbybob.com a place where people uh, can, I, I think, where can, they yeah. can get the resources? And, yeah. And, yeah. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> you can sign up for the semi-regular uh, email blast. Right. Um, and now the phone is starting to ring, so we're going to be putting up updated uh, performance schedule up there. We've got a handful of things coming with the next six months. Great. And we're all. How anxious. many? Um, but how many secular performances do you do a year? Well, in a year other than 2020 or 2021, uh, I, I might play 50 gigs. Uh, which is a juggling in addition to my full time job as a pastor. Mm -hmm. I do all the traditional pastor things. Uh, and with the band, probably, uh, I'm thinking about 20 or 25 gigs in a, in a good year. Mm -hmm. And that, and it, it is a journey. It doesn't always kind of settle. We do a lot of concert series for churches in the, in the East Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the secular things are with some of the same guys uh, playing more out of the broad jazz canon mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah it, it, it keeps me busy mm -hmm. and i've been worried about the guys in the band because uh, for most of them this is all they do 
and uh, they have been struggling this last year. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's been a really tough year for musicians and artists and and uh, all around. Um, we've been we felt so lucky to be able to still find ways to hang in there together and you know even though it was playing on you know uh, apps and having jock produce us and so forth we've 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 hung together which is really wonderful um uh for all of us we in in jazz sanctuary one of the things that we are always reaching for and exploring is um the 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 human need for spiritual community and uh i think clearly in your 31 years in this congregation and the gradual infusion of jazz as an occasional part of that, but also in the playing of jazz itself um, uh, it, it, in an ensemble, um, mm -hmm. th in that conversation that occurs and the simultaneous creativity. Um, there's a lot about spiritual community, I think, and I wondered if you could just reflect for a minute about your own experience of spiritual community. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, just at the basic human level, uh, I have become a pastor to the jazz musicians mm -hmm. and in uh, kind of a resident theologian, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of my role. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's regional. That's within an hour or two of, of where I live, because uh, musicians, you know, an, an hour is just starting on the road. I mean, it's not <laughs> yeah. that far. Exactly. Um, I, I think... Uh, what broadened my eyes was a, a piece uh, from um, Ched Meyer, C-H-E-D-M-Y-E-R-S, who's a Quaker theologian out on the West Coast uh, with the Bartimaeus Ministries, I think it's called. Uh, he's a, he's a top-notch biblical scholar. Um, and he had a, an unpublished piece, which I think is on his website, about how Pentecostalism uh, emerges at the same time that jazz does. Mm. Wow. Very early part of the 20th century. Huh. And he said, uh, both movements come from um, communities that have been sent to the sidelines. Mm. Both are broadly inclusive. Both are life-giving. Uh, both are full of passion and energy by which uh, people stop keeping track of how long this is going on. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you, people are caught up in the experience and the community is forged out of this shared sonic experience. Um, I think he's right on. Um, right. And yet uh, along with that is the uh, kind of entanglements of racism, uh, the disparaging of jazz musicians, um, the uh, the flooding of uh, uh, the flooding of uh, uh, narcotics and alcoholism in these impoverished musicians in the 40s and 50s that then gave it a bad cultural name in addition to its previous bad cultural name and the continuing um, well musicians are poorly paid uh, they they are marginal in many many ways. Um, they travel the highways like truck drivers. I mean, they're not, uh, and yet what they create is such beauty yeah. uh, and they do it with an audience which is built in community. Right, right. Um, and I've, I have a, a couple of university students that I work with as an adjunct um, in a small university nearby. And they want to learn jazz in their senior year of you know, music ed or whatever they're studying. And few of them have actually heard it. Mm. And I was like, okay, well, let's, this is not just some little hip thing that's a gut course like basket weaving. We're going to, there's a serious tradition. I said, but you need to see it as mm. well as hear it. Right. Uh, and you need to catch that the musicians are glancing at one another. And that means you take the next solo or we're going to head to the coda. Uh, pick up the cues and then perceive this as an art form that is truly communal. Mm. Um, it is one of the few art forms, performing art forms that is communal. Mm. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, the novelist writes in isolation, the painter paints off by herself and mm. so forth and so on, but jazz musicians work together. Right. 
and then the verbs get confused. Work and play are synonymous. <laughs> Amen. It, Amen. Is, it is about the only only employment where that is the case. Yeah, <laughs> it's <is> great. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Which may explain why a lot of jazz musicians are a little bit playful, if not downright childish. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, you know, we, we, child filled. We like to. <laughs> Absolutely. You've, uh, you've chosen a couple of uh, pieces for us uh, today. I wondered if you might want to say a little bit about those. Oh, what one would you like me to talk about first? Um, it, it, it about, uh, the, uh, the fun one is uh, Rumpelstiltskin. Yeah. Uh, which is um, this <laughs> kind of oddly shaped tune that just kind of came out one day when I was playing at the piano, kind of begins uh, with pentatonic patterns and, and gets funky in a hurry. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to imagine some little guy dancing around the fire after <laughs> and realizing uh, in the quartet or in, in the clip, what we have as, as a sextet, it's expanded. Um, that they're spinning straw into gold, mm. um, uh, which is about as imaginative as it comes. And so mm. I mean, there's no deep meaning other than uh, here a bunch of people having some fun. Yeah, your drummer is wonderful on that one, uh, as he is on both. But uh, uh, this is some other clips. Uh, there, you have there. You're all um, um, wonderful musicians. Uh, uh, let me let me tell you who's in in that formation of the band. Uh, drummer is Ron Vincent, mm -hmm. uh, who lives uh, outside of New York City, mm -hmm. and Ron was uh, Jerry Mulligan's last drummer. Wow. Um, Steve Laspina. Uh, is the bass player. He was actually filling in for us, and he's done that a number of times. Uh, he's in New Jersey, and uh, he played with Jim Hall and Marion McPartland and all the New York luminaries, as Ron has. Uh, the horns include Al Ham, uh, the older gentleman who is my college music professor, who's uh, trying as best he can to retire. <laughs> uh, his successor at Binghamton University is Mike Carbone, uh, who uh, is a wonderful saxophonist up in the Binghamton, New York area, uh, who plays a lot with us. We, we brought him to, uh, to Concord with our, our Christmas Eve band. He plays with us on Christmas Eve every year of the jazz service. Mm -hmm. And the trumpeter, uh, Jeff Stockham, uh, has a master's in East, from Eastman in French horn. Wow. And has played with Thelonious Monk's son. Um, wow toured with him so i mean these are serious dudes <laughs> yeah, yeah yes they are <laughs> and it, i i'm constantly feeling like uh i'm not a tennis player but i understand if you want to improve you play with people who are a lot better than you and uh and it lifts lifts it yeah. up I, I i i my own story is that i um went back to music for the first time since I was a kid when I was in my 50s. And uh, mm -hmm. so I've, it's been a steep mountain to climb. But uh, I, I am constantly um, on the bandstand at a pro-am golf tournament. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I am always the am. But, uh, but it's, a, it's a privilege and it's a great way to, to learn. <laughs> it is. It is. And I've also discovered that if you want to get good jazz musicians, um, you can usually get them on a Sunday. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, preferably in the afternoon. That's, that's right. That's right. That's when, that's when we do it. Well, that's wonderful. But, and let me tell you about the other two. Um, yeah. uh, the other piece is a setting of Jesu Joy of Man's Desire. Uh, amazing. Uh, yeah. Which uh, I, I heard Paul Winter's consort do it as a samba. And I said, uh, but they're not playing the whole piece. They're not playing kind of the chorale section. Right. So let me do that and then let me kind of uh, reharmonize it, make it a little crunchy. Yeah. Um, and it's the kind of tune we end a, a concert with because yeah. um, it's yes. stirring. Oh my gosh, the crowd went wild. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, it's it's really great. And you know, 
again, that that marriage of uh, spirituality and theology with with music and creativity is all in that piece yeah. uh, in a wonderful way. Uh, it, that's really great. Yeah, it's uh, and it, it takes a little bit of effort to take a piece that's in nine eight and then put it in two two cut time. <laughs> uh, it, well, that, that, yeah. that sounds like one of the things that you that you like to do. <laughs> I, well, I do, I do for instrumental pieces. If it, if we're backing up congregational singing, it's a whole different deal. Oh yes, absolutely. Because you've got to give it to the people right. and square off the rhythms, and then do fun stuff underneath and around right. them. Exactly. Yeah. I have to say, Bill, you were my inspiration uh, when, when we did a memorial, uh, a CD, a Christmas CD for a memorial fund for my dad. Nice. And um, I started out with all public domain Christmas carols. And then I, mm -hmm. um, thinking about my conversation with you when you played in Concord, I, I, I tried to change the meter of just about everything <laughs> and, and the feel. And I don't think it's I was definitely so. That. <laughs> I wasn't quite as successful as you as you are at it, but it was it was a fun project. Oh, you did a great job. No, well, it, it. I think it, it gets better the more you do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. If Christmas carols, we I think I told you we play the things that are in three, we play them in four, and the things that are in four, yep. we play in three. Yep. Except for we three kings, which we play in five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's only there's only you have to go there. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I guess in closing, I would ask uh, whether you, you have any 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 particular advice. We're seven years in, but we're mm -hmm. uh, our church uh, is also in transition. We've sold our building, and uh, we'll be looking for a new home that's more affordable. But along the way, we're also looking to have more of a hybrid ministry uh, online and in person, and have the jazz sanctuary be a, a sort of a, a forward part of that. And uh, I don't yeah. know if you have any advice for us or. You know, uh, one of the things that I have not been very successful at, but every once in a while we have the opportunity is to try to merge jazz with uh, alleviating human suffering. Mm. Mm. Uh, jazz and, and mission, however that is. Um, right. Yeah, we uh, we kind of backed into it uh, after Hurricane Sandy. A, a friend of mine was on the coast of Jersey, mm -hmm. and his town lost half of the homes in Point Pleasant, uh, New Jersey. And uh, I was calling to check on him, and what can we do? And this, I you know, I I want to do something more than pray. And then we both the light went off. Why don't you play a concert for us? And I said, well, uh, let's let's work on that. So I set up a crowdfunding site and we raised enough money and then some to cover the cost of the band uh, for the musicians who didn't want to donate their services. I mean, I got that. They, they have bills to pay, but I could certainly donate mine. And uh, then we had extra money, which we kind of gave to relief efforts. Mm -hmm. And then my church got word of this and they made, a, I think it was like 70 dozen Christmas cookies which we uh, took down and distributed to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, their church was standing, but every other institution in town was wiped out. Wow. Uh, they had no, uh, they, no possibility of having choral music or rehearsals uh, with people who had dispersed because of this. The, and, and we were able through music to give some, a gift to the community. Yeah, um, it's wonderful. And it was all the Christmas stuff. Um, yeah. So I mean, I, I, that, that intrigues me. Uh, yeah. I would encourage you to think about that as I think about that. Um, yeah, that's uh, I, I, that's wonderful. I, I never thought of it that way, but it it yeah. it triggers in me uh, during the pandemic. My brother, who lives in Brooklyn, came up here because it was safer, frankly, and lived with us for 13 months. And he's a trombone player, and uh, yeah. so we did a hundred nights of concerts on you know on my outside on my on my back in the driveway and the neighbors came and yeah. and that I, that's when you said that it, that the light went off that yeah, yeah. kind of what was going on there yeah our our county in pennsylvania lackawanna county uh freed up some arts performance funds they were concerned about musicians losing their oh. livelihood and people 
of people who were just feeling distressed and they thought the arts could help at least touch the pain and heal some of it. And uh, so we were able to get some funding from that and we put on three concerts. We did a 100th, 100th birthday party for Dave Brubeck on his 100th birthday in December. Mm -hmm. uh, I brought in some friends to, uh, to play Beethoven on Valentine's Day. Wow. And then for Lent, we did a Blue Note music concert, all the music from the classic Blue Note label oh, wow. quintet. And we, we live streamed it. We had very few people in the sanctuary because mm -hmm. of the regulations and such. But we had uh, about three or 400 hits on each one of those mm -hmm. uh, and full length. I mean, people were watching the whole thing. Wow. Wow. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of funny, I, 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 you know, I've never been one to sit around and feel sorry for myself. Um, if, if things are tough, I tend to dig in, but I also try to flip it and say, what can I do for other people? Right. You know, and, and I think music provides such a gift. And, and so I encourage you to keep thinking about that. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and just to find ways to keep going. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah. This this musical tradition is is extraordinary. Uh, there's yes. an inner vitality to it. Um, yes. that I think Cohen it, it's it coincides between the human spirit and the Holy Spirit. That there's some some marriage that help it hap, that happens, mm. and uh, mm. that's what I remember the first time I heard Count Basie. It was like, wow, there yeah. is something here that they are conjuring up. I don't know how they're doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember Bobby McFerrin saying to me one time, the comment he wants to hear more than anything else is the person who says, I feel good. Yes. <laughs> that, that the music creates yeah. something in right. us. Um, right. Yes. So stay at it, guys. Stay yeah. at it. Well, thank you. I, we, we will, and and with you, with your wonderful contribution today, this is part of part of our staying at it. So, yeah, uh, thank you so much, and uh, and and you know, blessings on your continued ministry. It's just amazing. Uh, it's uh, it's thirty one years young. It sounds like. <laughs> Uh, and, and 60 in formation <laughs> yes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I, I understand that too <laughs> thank you so much All right hey thank you thank you